everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, my name is Sarah Walker and I'm a professor at Arizona State University where I study astrobiology and the origins of life. Um, and I'm trained in theoretical physics. So I think about them very much from the perspective of understanding fundamental principles. Um, so just to get started, um, I am really deeply interested in this question about whether life has universal principles, as I mentioned. Um, and I've been working in this field for quite a long time. So I'm going to kind of do a little bit of a story starting from um, when, um, you know, uh, we're thinking about the history of the origins of life field and where we need to go in the future and how we should be thinking about this problem about what life actually is. So being trained in physics, and thinking like a cosmologist, um, I'm really interested in the idea that there are um, explanations that we have for a lot of the stuff in our universe, but we're kind of missing the critical components. So um, if you look at sort of the physical theories that we know so far and the things that we can talk about in the universe, um, we have great explanations for most of the matter content in the universe and some idea of what dark matter and dark energy might be, or there's theories out there. We have no constraints on this process that's the most like us, which is what we call life. Um, and we don't know how much of it is out there. And we actually really don't even know how to talk about the question yet in this kind of terms. Um, but having come from a discipline um, where we want to think about these questions in sort of the grandest sense and talk about these universal principles and laws, I think we do have to assume that life has some universal properties in order to look for it in the universe. And so this is sort of the framing of the question that I think is going to be the most important way of tackling it. And the origins of life is really related to this what is life question or how we can think about defining life um, because it's the place that we're really confronted with how hard this question actually is. Um, so when we're thinking about origins of life science, um, you know, the, the question of what life is really is about the transition from non-living matter to living matter. Um, but that's not necessarily the way that origins of life has been framed for at least the last hundred years. We do have a lot of progress in understanding some of the chemical details. Um, so the leading sort of set of hypotheses about the origins of life actually go back now 100 years to the time of Haldane and O'Perrin when they were proposing what was called the primordial soup hypothesis, which is that if you get some chemical mixtures on the prebiotic earth um, and they acquire sufficiently complex sufficient complexity, they'll start evolving um, into the kind of life forms that we know today. So basically, you just need a complex chemical mixture and some evolutionary process to get started. And this is sort of the idea behind the primordial soup. Um, but you'll notice that this is sort of a very much the problem of life is solved by the chemistry. So we just need to figure out the details of the chemical components, or at least how we can make the ingredients of life on early Earth, and then we solve the problem. And um, so this life is chemistry view has really dominated most of origins of life um, research for the last 100 years. And most of the definitions that we have for what life is are actually based on this view that life is a chemical phenomena. Um, and as I'm going to get to a little bit later in my talk, I don't necessarily disagree that chemistry is important to life. And in fact, I think that life um, emerges in chemistry for good reason, because chemistry is sort of the first scale of physical reality where the kind of physics that actually governs life can actually start taking hold, um, which I'll describe in a few minutes. Um, but part of the problem with this sort of set of definitions surrounding thinking just strictly about the chemistry and what life does is that we end up with a lot of paradoxes um, and a lot of contrasting definitions. So this is just a word cloud, um, uh, not to be taken too seriously, but it's, it's containing keywords in sort of some of the most common definitions for life. Um, and this is actually a word cloud taken from a paper that was written um, about a decade ago now, um, which basically tried to take all the definitions for life and then combine them into a consensus definition um, by taking all of the sort of most common features of the definitions. And I remember when I first read this paper thinking to myself, well, this isn't science. This is not hypothesis driven. We're not testing any ideas about what the underlying fundamental explanation for life is. This is more like we have these sort of descriptions and we don't really know what to do with them. Um, and this is really sort of the driving force between mo uh, behind most hypotheses about the origins of life now, especially with respect to the prebiotic soup, are mostly in the realm of these kind of descriptive ways of talking about what life is that then inform how we're thinking about what we're going to do in the lab. They're not really quantitatively driven and they're not theory, theory driven. Um, so what's the problem with taking those kind of definitions for life? Um, well, Carl Sagan actually had this really nice example that uh, he walked through um, in a paper that he wrote um, 
a while ago about defining life where he goes based on this definition that is one that you might see in any biology textbook, which is that it's any system capable of performing such, such functions as eating, metabolizing, excreting, breathing, moving, growing, reproducing, and being responsive to external stimuli. So this seems like a pretty straightforward definition. Um, I think most of us might agree that these are all qualities that we could associate with living things. But Carl's point in that essay was actually to make a little bit of a joke about that, which was, if this is sort of the defining feature of life, any aliens visiting Earth might think that cars were the dominant life form because they satisfy all of those criteria that we just had. Um, And obviously, most of us might not feel comfortable with that, um, but we could take it one step further and say, well, cars actually have even been in space, so maybe this is actually a viable definition. Um, so, so one of the things that I think was really um, well pointed out um, in this essay um, is, well, first off, there is no viable definition, and I think that's still widely agreed upon today. There's, at least there's no scientifically agreed upon definition for life. And part of the reason that's the case is actually encapsulated in this quote um, from the same essay by Carl Sagan, um, where he says that many such properties are either present in machines, so he's referring to the definition I just gave, so excreting and all of these other, um, you know, metabolizing, reproducing. They're present in machines that nobody is willing to call alive or absent from organisms that everyone is willing to call alive. And so I disagree on the point of machines, which I'll get to in a few minutes, but but I think the, the key point to take from this is actually that if you start from trying to take the properties that we associate with life and build a definition from them, you always have cases you want to include and cases you want to exclude. Um, and then when you work sort of axiomatically from that to build the definition, you always end up in this kind of paradoxical situation where some of the cases you wanted to include are actually excluded, and some of the cases you meant to exclude are actually included in your definition. And this is one of the reasons that viruses have been so hard to accommodate when people are talking about definitions of device to of life and why we have um, all of these sort of edge cases that don't quite fit our definitions or lead to these kind of paradoxical sets of assumptions. And one of the problems here is that people are often trying to tackle describing life instead of addressing underlying issues um, or underlying explanations that you might be able to derive properties of life from. Um, So this is kind of more of the perspective that a theoretical physicist would take and I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, but some people have like gotten so <laughs> exasperated with the whole effort of trying to define life that um, they've actually gone so far as to radically claim that life does not exist. So Andy Ellington, for example, is an RNA chemist, and I remember being quite shocked when I was a postdoc seeing giving him, him giving a talk um, where he actually made this claim that life does not exist. And I think his point was actually very well articulated um, in an essay by Nobel laureate Jack Shostak, um, also a leading chemist in Origins of Life, where he says that as one focuses experimentally on any of the defining properties of life, the sharp boundary seems to blur, splitting into finer and finer subdivisions. So the key point here is when you look at individual molecules or the chemistry that life is composed of, of, you don't see the features that we associate with life. And of course, this is kind of intuitively obvious. Um, most people think of life as a systems level property or an emergent property. So for example, the atoms in my body are not alive, but I, I as an entity am alive. So somehow we have to capture that in, in whatever it is that we're talking about. But it doesn't seem to be present if we just talk about chemistry. Um, so trying to dig for deeper principles is obviously something that um, a lot of people are really interested in. and um, you know, in asking this question, what is life, uh, we can think, of, at least from the tradition of a physicist, going all the way back to Erwin Schrodinger and probably even earlier. I know many people have thought about this, but he had a very nice um, set of lectures that he turned into a book um, that he gave, um, was published in 1944. Um, on the topic, what is life? And that book's actually historically important because it's said to have inspired Watson and Crick to look for the structure of DNA, which they discovered along with Rosalind Franklin. Um, So what what is life? What was he actually asking? Well, he wanted to know about how physics and chemistry can explain what's happening inside a living cell. And so this is obviously um, a question of interest. I'm not sure that the spatial boundary of a living organism, thinking about a cell as a fundamental unit is the right way to think about it. Um, But asking the question about whether physics and chemistry can explain life is really critically important. Um, And part of his own explanation was to come up with this idea of negentropy, which is that life locally increases order, um, but does contribute to sort of increasing entropy, which is important in thermodynamics. And that was sort of part of his explanation for life. 
But he ultimately concluded that that wasn't really sufficient to explain life. And in fact, my favorite quote in the whole book, um, which is kind of motivating the title of my talk, is that living matter, while now eluding the laws of physics as established up to date, is likely to involve other laws of physics hitherto unknown. So this gets to the point that is really sort of the central focus of this talk, which is when we actually understand what life is, I think it's going to actually involve new laws of physics that we don't understand yet, and they might be quite different than the laws of physics that we know now. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below, or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.